What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What are you doing here? What's the purpose of your existence? Why are you alive? Why am I alive? That's the question or the kind of question that we're discussing on this program each day. And uh, to answer it, of course, we tried to go to the roots of our origins and we tried to establish what we thought was the origin of the universe. And we were driven, of course, by the order and design in the universe and by the personableness of us persons to the conclusion that there had to be some kind of supreme being. And we arrived at the same conclusion as men like Einstein did, that the order and design that we perceive in the universe must have been put there by an intelligence that is at least as great as ours and presumably greater. And that intelligence must be as personable as we ourselves are. And so, over the months of this past year, we have argued our way through together from that position of theism, we call it, belief in some kind of God or supreme being, to the place where we concluded that uh, the man who lived in the first century of our era, uh, that man Jesus of Nazareth, was really the son of the maker of the universe, and that the documentary evidence, the manuscript evidence that is available in places like the British Museum, proved his historicity, and the evidence for his power over nature and disease and his power over death itself proved that, in fact, he was able to leave this earth and to come back to it whenever he wished, and that he was, in fact, the son of the maker of our world. And what we have been doing is studying his explanation of why we're here and how we're meant to operate in this present life. And, of course, he made it very plain that we were put here by his father, our maker, so that we might become his friends. That's it so that we might come into a love relationship with our Creator. And that's why you are here. You are a special to your Maker. You know, there's nobody like you. Nobody like you. He made only one of you. You're a one-off. And he made you so that he could have your friendship and so that you could have his. That's it. So that you could be his child and he could be your father. And that's why he made you like himself. And we've been discussing how he made us to operate on three levels. On a physical level, with these bodies that we have, through our five senses, we can perceive the world of people and circumstances and things. Through our soul level, or our psychological level, our mind and emotions and will, by which we are conscious of ourselves and of our own thoughts and our feelings. And our spirit level, the part of us that is able to communicate with him. And what we've been discussing, first of all, is that spirit level. And we've said that that is the part that really communes with God. That's one of its functions, communion with God. And why so many of us have such frustrating experiences of religion is that we're always trying to do it on our psychological level, through uh, concentrating with our minds, through meditating on things in our minds, through producing certain feelings either with drugs or with ecstasy of some kind in our emotions. And all the time we're dealing only with ourselves because that whole psychological part of us is able to be conscious alone of ourselves. It cannot have any contact with the supreme being beyond the universe. That is done through our spirits. And if you say, what is my spirit? My spirit is my real self, what you really are, what you are deep down and what you really want and what you really desire. That's your spirit. And that has an ability to commune with God. But you're dead right if you say, oh, I don't know that I have a spirit. I've never felt it. I've never thought it. I've never sensed it. No, your spirit operates through your faith. Faith is believing a certain thing and acting in the light of it. It's believing that there is a God and then acting in the light of that, wanting him to communicate with you, wanting him through your faith to communicate with you, just wanting him desperately. And that's why the few moments that you have had in your life where you have been conscious of God have been usually moments of desperation. Moments of great tragedy in your life where you've just cried out to God without any ability to manipulate your thoughts or your feelings or any ability to think things through, thinks things through. You've just wanted them with all your being. And somehow or other, he has seemed to be real to you. That's because your spirit is the deepest part of you. And it's the part of you that expresses your deepest desires. 
And when you express that deep desire to God, he comes through to you in a way that baffles all calculation and analysis. Now, another part of your spirit is your conscience. And what we've been saying is that one of the strongest moves you can make if you're really serious about contacting the supreme being behind the universe is to respond to your conscience. Respond to your conscience. Your conscience is the part of your spirit that urges you to act up to the best that you know, to live up to the best that you know. Now, it's not a set of rules and regulations. That often is the mistake that you and I make. We try to observe the rules and regulations that our teachers give us, or that religious people give us, or that our minister gives us, or that our father and mother give us, and those are guides at the beginning of our life. But the vital guide that is God's personal witness inside our own beings is our conscience. And your conscience is God's own personal signals to you. And if you begin to respond to that conscience and to live by it, you find your spirit gets stronger and God himself begins to be real to you. Many of us, of course, for good reasons and bad, have ignored our consciences so much that they almost are dead also. We do it in two ways, of course. Some of us do it in the usual old way. You know, we sow our wild oats and we ignore the things that our conscience is telling us to do or we ignore the things that we were brought up to believe are right. And, of course, we learn to sear our conscience and it goes dead and we become one of those mindless, staring creatures that look as if they're on drugs even if they're not on drugs because you almost lose yourself. Have you ever looked in your own eyes and wondered, is there anybody there? Is there anybody there? There. And you've certainly done it when you've looked at people across the tube. You've said, is there anybody there? Is there anybody inside at all? Those eyes look as if there's a nothing in there. And many of us actually feel that way. We feel we're just blobs. We feel there's no self inside. There's no me any longer. And the reason is that we've ceased virtually to exist. We've become the sum total of what everybody else thinks we should do or what we think we should do ourselves. But we haven't really responded to our own conscience deep down. But many of us have gone the other way. It's not simply that we've turned against the standards that we were brought up with. Many of us are totally dominated by other people's standards and other people's ideas. Many of us in, in what we call good ways. Many of us think we're good. We try all the tricks that various religious people tell us to try. Often we do it in the church, often we do it outside the church, often we do it intellectually. We have some professor that we respect greatly and we try to find his way to truth and we do what he thinks we should do. Often when we get into businesses and jobs and companies, we are dominated by what they think we should do. Often when we watch a lot of TV, we're dominated by what the TV thinks we should do, or we're dominated by what the newspapers think we should do. Most of us now live in such a global village that we are dominated by what everybody thinks and everybody says, and we lose ourselves because we're listening so busily to what everybody else thinks we ought to do. Now, the fact is that your conscience is God's own personal indication to you of how you should live, and you need to respect that. If you say, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you'll be walking along the street, and some thought will come into your mind, boy, I should write a letter to that person. Do it, do it, do it. Or you're, you're walking along the street and some thought comes into your mind, I ought not to worry so much as I do. Stop worrying, stop worrying. Or you're walking along fascinated by your own financial difficulties and a thought comes into your mind, I should not worry like this. There is someone who takes care of me. Obey that voice, obey it. Listen to your conscience, respond to your conscience. Uh, there's actually an amazing verse that I quoted to you a couple of days ago in the Bible. The spiritual man is uh, judged by no one. And strictly speaking, that's true. The person who wants to live in their spirit, who wants to live a real life, and a real life of relationship with the supreme being behind the universe, is a person who cannot actually be judged, strictly speaking, by anybody else. Because nobody else can tell what their conscience is saying to them. That's why, actually, you have no right to look down on other people or criticize other people or tell other people where they're wrong. Because all you can do is judge them by your light, by your conscience. And that's not fair. 
They have to be judged by their own conscience. They have to live by their own conscience. So it's vital for you to respond, whether you're an artist or a musician, whether you're a writer, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're an electrician, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a laborer, whether you're a road maker, you need to listen to your conscience. Your conscience is the part of your spirit that is probably still most alive inside you. Let's talk a little more about your spirit tomorrow.